um, uh, with, with a, uh, a talented group of speakers. Uh, this uh, event uh, is particularly exciting for us because it's not only um, in, in partnership and led by the, the City of Sydney Visiting Entrepreneur Program, uh, Visiting Entrepreneur Program uh, but we also have uh, members of, uh, of, of the various uh, universities, um, UTS, UNSW and the University of Sydney represented. So you really are getting uh, a, a fantastic view from, from the local ecosystem. Uh, but also with Robert uh, and uh, very much an international uh, flavour as well. Uh, it's also uh, my role to uh, acknowledge this meeting place uh, that, we, uh, that we were all in today uh, and to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of, uh, of this meeting place. And that's the, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects on behalf of all present and, and the SSE uh, to Elders past, present and future. A few words of housekeeping before uh, I hand over and we get started. Um, uh, bathrooms are out to the front, to the entrance that you, uh, that you came through before. Gents is on the ground floor. Ladies and accessible is on the first floor. And there is a lift. We didn't put the accessible one up the stairs without a lift. Um, and uh, if you hear, if there's an emergency warning uh, of any description, please just look out for one of the SSE teams ourselves and we'll lead you out to a marshalling area in Jones Street Wharf. Uh, sorry, Jones Street Mall. Very unlikely to happen. I even said wharf because it's never happened before. Uh, but, uh, but keep an eye. If, if there's any other needs that you have uh, during the course of, uh, of the event, just, uh, just uh, locate one of, one of our team and we'll be, um, we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, welcome once again and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Alex Curtis, who's Program Manager of the Visiting Entrepreneur Program for City of Sydney. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I just wanted to very quickly say, on behalf of the City of Sydney, thank you for being here. Um, the Visiting Entrepreneur Program is something we produce twice a year. Uh, it's a series of free events with international entrepreneurs or experts, and we co-create it with the tech ecosystem here in Sydney. So there's over 80 ecosystem partners we work with, um, including our fantastic partners today. So big thanks to SSE for hosting us, um, UTS, Incubate, uh, and UNSW. It's a great collaboration. We're really thankful for everyone to help us put this program together in this event. And um, a huge thanks as well to Robert, who is our visiting entrepreneur here today. Um, he is so generously given his time. He's in Sydney for a week um, for a whole series of free events. So it's great that you guys are here today. I encourage you to check out the schedule and some of the other events. And without further ado, I'll introduce Jennifer Zanich. She's our MC. She's the head of ecosystem and partnerships at UNSW. And we'll get started. Thanks. I think I've got... Um, You've got one already. Yeah, I'm wired up. One false move and I'll pull the string. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer Zanich and I'm going to be your MC for this um, program this afternoon. This is going to be the most exciting panel conversation you've seen all day. Um, oh, so, <laughs> well, for me, because this is the only one I've been to. So we've got an incredible lineup of people to come and talk to you about a very interesting topic that I hope is close to all your hearts. So let's get them up. Let's invite Eva up first. Eva Sheng, um, Robert Chong, and James Alexander, if you just want to kind of grab a seat. Um, and just as they're taking their seat, the topic that we're discussing today is around equipping you and your startup to succeed in Australasia. So hopefully that's why you're all here, because that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and this is kind of coming from a backdrop um, where we're looking, there's some uh, reports out from the OECD recently that 67% of current students are going to graduate into jobs that are not yet created. So this is about equipping people with the skills, the knowledge and the education they need to potentially start their own companies. Um, so, and how do they then take it from Australia into the Australasian area? So just a sense of who's in the room. Do we have any current students in the room? <coughs> yes. Do we have any entrepreneurs, people starting companies? <coughs> Yay. Um, anybody from corporate? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> anybody from the big four banks? Yay. <laughs> anybody else? that wants to shout out that I didn't kind of catch you. So your student, current entrepreneur, starting their own company. Awesome. Okay. 
So what we might do is just go around the um, panel. So why don't you introduce, um, talk to us a little bit about yourself and your affinity with this particular challenge. Thanks, Jennifer. So hi, everyone. My name's Eva. I'm one of the lecturers in the Faculty of Engineering and IT at UTS. But my role is actually a little bit split. I do lots of interesting uh, but very diverse things. So in terms of my lecturing position, I teach first year engineering, which is really exciting. We are looking at the future of work and what does engineering and tech look like when our students might graduate in five years' time. So how do we prepare that? But also how do we change the way we teach our students for that? So that's the teaching part. My research, my background is in telecommunications. And that doesn't mean I know anything about mobile networks because I don't. What I know about is multimedia. So I look at signals from the point of view of speech and audio and video. And this is what brought me to what I do today, which is working with a lot of different creatives in terms of musicians and filmmakers and how do we develop algorithms to get multimedia content to people. And I collaborate with startups, particularly in this space. Another part of my job um, is that I'm very passionate about getting students to where they want to be. So part of that will be talking to first-year students. What is it you want to achieve? How can we help you get there in the time we have with you? And entrepreneurship is certainly in that mindset. But also, we are now in a global workforce. How do we get you out into the world or bring the world to you? So I work on a lot of global mobility programs to get our students out there. So I'll start with that. Oh, before you go, fun yeah. fact. Fun fact. Um, I'm part Peruvian, and our family no just visited Peru. Uh, it might take us a while to dig up those family roots. So wow. watch that space. Peruvian. Hello, uh, my name is Robert Shong. I'm the managing director of Udacity China. Uh, Udacity is the largest online platform to learn tech skills in the world, uh, with over 10 million students learning things like AI, data science, uh, robotics, self-driving cars, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're based out of Silicon Valley. Uh, we're last valued at uh, over a billion dollars in, in our last D round in 2016. Um, and uh, I lead the China business. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur since 2008. Um, and uh, my first startup, I literally landed in Beijing, uh, didn't know anyone, uh, didn't really speak Chinese that well, and, um, and started my first startup there um, and sold that business uh, three years later um, and spent uh, a number of um, years in sort of B round, C round role uh, startups as a C-level executive, sort of helping startups um, pivot the business or raise funds or get acquired. Um, and at that time, um, 2015, Udacity came to me and said, you know, we want to start the China business. Um, and so since then, I've been, you know, running a startup in a startup, um, you know, uh, building the China business from just one person in a very, very tiny office. And today we have over 100 people uh, in our Shanghai office and Beijing offices. Um, so excited to share some of my experiences here uh, and help you guys um, get on the right foot. Fun fact. Uh, fun fact, um, I was the lead singer in the, in the rock band um, that we had at my business school. Yeah. <laughs> so I like holding the mic. <laughs> so like a K-pop band, yeah. A C-pop, China pop. I can make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, James, tell us a little bit about you. Cool. Um, so my name is James Alexander. Um, I'm the program manager at Incubate, which is the uh, incubator at Sydney University. And uh, I guess you could say sometimes it feels like sometimes we're a bit of a startup helping startups um, with inside a higher education institution, which is really interesting. Um, I think the interesting thing about us is we started really early, so in about 2012, when if you think back to then, there was really very little conversation around students and entrepreneurship and startups. Um, it was just starting to happen, so uh, we've seen that all reverse, and now you know we ha we're in this space, which is like four universities and entrepreneurship, which is like crazy. Um, so seeing that, I'm also involved in a, venture f a seed fund called Galileo Ventures, which is, uh, again, a new fund to like, invest in young entrepreneurs in Australia, which, again, is, 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 a, is, is, is a fairly new thing for Australia. Um, so I've seen and helped a lot of entrepreneurs in Australia um, and in Sydney, um, and many of which are global companies um, and some of which are local companies. So I've seen both sides of the coin. Um, fun fact, uh, in university... Um, we had a fun night for up-and-coming musicians, which I used to run. Um, this is, I think it's a theme for up-and-coming things with me. Um, and one of our first launch night, we hosted a little band and it was one of their first live gigs, and it was called Rufus. 
<laughs> and obviously, for those of you into this type of music, Rufus has become really, really big now um, and doing really well. And uh, they're now in LA um, right. doing really good stuff. So, yeah. So, did you get a percentage or anything of that? <laughs> no, I should have joined them as a singer, yeah, maybe, you know? <laughs> exactly. You bang the drums or something. Yeah. So. Right, thank you guys for that great introduction. So as you can see, we've got a very well-qualified and experienced panel of people here for you. So the idea is that they're here also to answer all your questions. So we do have roving mics. Don't wait till the end. If you feel that we're not actually getting to the point that you want us to address something in particular, call out the mic and we'll go straight to the point, okay? Because we want to make sure that you get the answers that you need rather than us kind of rambling up here about what we think you want to hear. So please don't be shy. We're happy to have um, interjections all the way through. So to kind of kick it off, given that, you know, we're um, representing, I guess, the education sector from different um, perspectives, you know, what role um, and what kind of courses or um, involvement have you laid out so that students or people can actually chart a course in startups uh, or entrepreneurship. Eva, do you want to tackle that one? Like, what, what are you doing? Because I was actually quite fascinated about the fact you're doing this first year engineering and it's kind of like, what, it'd be interesting to know, what, what are you seeing that you need to bring into the engineering to help them and equip them as well? But just generically, like, what is the role that your um, institution's playing in equipping the young people of today with the startup knowledge they need? I think one of the first messages, and it's why it's important to have it in first year, is that these opportunities ex exist and they are for you. Universities are a great space to explore what that looks like for you and where you can try things and the consequences aren't as dire when you do that out in the real world right. and there actually is a lot of impact, especially in resourcing and money and people and time. So what we teach in first year is a deep dive into what engineering looks like. So not only do you need to be technical, but you also need to have the breadth of professional skills, and entrepreneurship is a really key part of that. And that can be, it doesn't need to be a startup that you're going to do, but it's the entrepreneurial mindset of how do you think differently? How do you solve the complex problems that we have and we are going to be facing for the foreseeable future? So we deep dive into project-based learning. Wow. So we work also in the social impact space. Uh, we work with Engineers Without Borders, where all the engineering students work on a design brief, pick a challenge they're interested in, come up with a design solution in teams, and we feed that back to engineers without borders. And that's just a starting point. And that usually sparks students off into, wow, I didn't actually know you could connect all these different things together. I can design something from day one at university. What can I do next is usually the question I get. So in terms of, in general, what the university offers, there are a lot of subject electives that students can take, and there are also internship opportunities as well, where if students are interested in doing an internship, they can either join an existing startup or if they'd like to start their own, that becomes a subject as well. So there's lots of different things that you can try. We've also got, we'll talk about this more, international opportunities where you can see what an ecosystem looks like internationally as part of your degree program. Can I just ask a quick question? I know we've got one coming out of the audience. Yeah. But when people sign up to engineering, they're coming in to do engineering or do you do what percentage of them have startup or my you know my own product I'm going to create? when they come into the course? Yes, I love understanding who's in the room, um, especially so I understand who the students are. It changes every year. Every group of students is unique. I've been teaching first year in engineering for about five years now at different universities as well, and it's shifted a lot. So I love asking, what brought you here? Who's your role model? doesn't have to be technical. And where would you like to be? And over the last couple of years, two, three years in particular, hands up, first day at uni, because I'm usually a Monday lecture, 30% of students, at least, are interested in something different, an entrepreneurial activity, being in a startup, starting a startup. So it's actually from day one students are keen. So I think this is where the education needs to start, is from day one. It's interesting because we um, have been running at UNSW some breakfast for female and engineering, and um, we found that we weren't actually getting a lot of the young girls to come to the breakfast if we used startup or entrepreneurship in the language. Um, and so we would just do females and engineering breakfast and then they'd come along and then they would learn, oh, yeah, I, I can do that. Have you found that? Are you, have you found you have to change your language to speak to young girls? Yeah, so this is the other part of my job uh, I didn't quite explain before as I work in the Women in Engineering and IT program, uh, which is there to encourage young women from primary school through high school and our existing students and connected to industry on what opportunities are there. So yes, the language does make a difference because people already have perceptions around engineering and tech and IT and also entrepreneurship. 
So one of the challenges is, is that for me? And if there haven't been any visible role models, for some people it's hard to be what you can't see. So definitely the language and reaching out to young people to show them that this is possible and this is how we get started. Okay, cool. So Robert, we're just going to take a question from the audience. Did No, you're roving around with the mic. I just saw you waving it there. Robert, over to you. So, I mean, yeah, um, latching on to, to what Eva said, I think, I mean, first of all, my, myself, uh, I, my undergraduate, um, um, when I went to the, um, college, um, I decided to pursue a dual degree, actually, in computer science and in business right. um, with that pure purpose. Um, I've never coded a single line of code in my life <laughs> since I graduated. I spent four years very painfully learning how to code, writing operating systems, like learning algorithms, and so on and so forth. But the multidisciplinary sort of understanding of what code can do and what computer science can do uh, has uh, enabled me to be able to combine that knowledge with um, the things I learned in business in the different fields that I've worked in to create opportunities, um, entrepreneurial opportunities. And that really is at the core of being an entrepreneur, um, is being able to combine multiple disciplines uh, to create something new and that has business value, uh, whether it be for consumers or enterprises or for government, right? Um, so, I mean, at Udacity, we also, um, I mean, we have courses in um, uh, business, uh, digital marketing, in uh, design, we have a design sprint course that was designed by Google Ventures that helps you learn how to design products really quickly and get feedback. Um, but actually one of our most popular courses is an intro to programming course, um, which basically teaches you the very basics of building a web page, um, writing a Python program, um, and gets you to understand the power of code. Um, and that course, um, likewise, is a course that's taken by a lot of students who have no interest in actually pursuing career as a computer programmer. Uh, a lot of students take that course just so they can understand what code is and what it can do. And, and I think that's an invaluable skill, especially in this sort of modern area where software is eating the world, you know, mm -hmm. as, as they say. What's, what's your gender split of people coming to your courses? Um, so our gender split is around 60% male, 40%. Female. And what about um, geographical diversity? Are they all in larger cities or towns, or are you finding regional people? So actually, um, I could speak to, in, in China, uh, 60 to 70 percent come from um, smaller, like towns outside the major cities. Right. right? Um, and, that, and that's also the power of the internet, the power mm -hmm. of online education, is that we can reach people um, that do not have access to the best educational resources. Right? Um, so even, I mean, regardless of what section of on the education you're in, whether it's K to 12 or what we do is with adult education, it's the same, right? So I think about, for my daughter, I can walk downstairs and there's like a Disney English education sort of kindergarten or play school where she can go and learn English. But in a third tier city in China, that, that doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? So for, for those children, they have to learn online, right? And it's, it's similar for uh, Medicare and, and a, lot of other, a lot of other services received as well. Um, so, I mean, I think that's an amazing opportunity that the internet has opened up for, for everyone around the world. Right. Okay. James, what's happening over at uh, University of Sydney as far as entrepreneurial programming and... Yeah, so um, Sydney University is similar to the other universities in that it's kind of become um, a really important part of like the undergraduate curriculum. Um, they have an ambitious idea to have everyone um, do some sort of entrepreneurial unit in their undergrad. That's 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 kind of the goal. Um, and I know why, why 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 is that important? So it's become an attribute of the um, what they call sort of graduate outcomes. So so having an entrepreneurial component in the outcome. So say that you've done something in that space is is become um, um, a sort of a strategic goal if you like. Right. And I think the, the the more the more interesting question is like why why has a university done that? given that universities historically have all been about, you know, research and then sort of undergraduate teaching. And I think that's just a shift in the way we think about how to teach people stuff. And I think that's part of a broader trend, which is like um, uh, what, what is a good way to teach um, adults? How, how do you teach adults new things? And, um, and how, where, where do they learn? How do they learn and where do they learn best? And I think what, 
what we're heading towards is, is, is a model where it's far more, um, what you can call sort of challenge-based learning, where it's like, here's a challenge, go solve it. And it's like, and you actually learn a lot during that. And if you think about it, startups are really just kind of that, which is like, here's a problem, go solve it. <laughs> um, some problems are really, really hard. <laughs> Other problems, not so hard, you know. But, uh, but, 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 um, but I think, I think um, you know, when I think about some of the interesting units around, which is all like project-based units, which is like a problem, um, um, it's really is, it's very similar to what we do in the Accelerator program, which is a 14-week program to basically launch your business. Um, um, you know, just, it's just slightly different in terms of the outcome, which, I, which, is, which you know, is also interesting. Yeah. And so do you feel like, um, oh, question, yay. Yeah. Break the ice here. Thank you. Um, I actually went to New South Wales Uni in 98, um, and at that point in time I was actually doing a biotech degree, and uh, there were, I actually had a scholarship at the Garvin, and I decided working in a lab every day for the next rest of my life was not something that you know, I found it a bit laborious. So I actually wanted to do business, but there wasn't any program that allowed me to do that. So I had to get a scholarship from um, the Faculty of Economics and Commerce and Life Sciences to do a joint honours program. You mentioned about engineering before. Is it just like computer science or software engineering or is it other engineering and uh, what about you know, other sciences, uh, chemistry, biotech? Uh, what's happening in that space to... When I finished, I, I wanted to go out and work for a biotech company, but the ecosystem didn't exist and there weren't <coughs> any biotech companies 20 years ago. There still aren't very many. Um, and I think this is perfect. And I think that the barriers to entry are coming down as well, to actually get into something like that. So like, what's, what, what are you guys finding and what can we do to like, encourage like, other sciences and other technologists actually uh, innovate and solve the problems that we have in the world? Great question. Do you want to go at that one, James? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think that touches on the whole, the whole point of like a, when a university goes, oh, well, entrepreneurship's not just for engineering students, you know, or computer science students. And I think, I think broadly, though, uh, technology is, is in recent history been about um, um, software but, but if you go back in history, technology was technology innovation was not about software. Well, software no. didn't exist. It was about all sorts of things. Any anything that is innovative in terms of your industry, you know, whether that's um, um, in in a small small business or whether that's in a large business, you know, um, oil exploration at one point was like bleeding edge technology. Um, venture funds actually funded that, uh, and that was that was that that was they made really you know obviously very 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 big companies. Um, but um, um, so recently, it's been there's been a lot of focus on information technology as, as like the only thing that's sort of innovation, but that's that's obviously not true. And I think I think part of that stems to the fact that in a lot of disciplines, um, like for example, I talk to some social humanities students, and I go, "Have you ever thought about yourself as an entrepreneur?" And they go, "What?" <laughs> They're like, "What's an entrepreneur?" Like you know, someone like that started their own business, and they're like. No, <laughs> and I, I and, and and so I ask the same question to a lot of students, and it's interesting because the language is, is difficult because yeah. like they don't like think of it, and they're like, "What about yourself as a business owner?" And they go, "Oh, business is boring," you know. And so so I think there there is a there is a there is a very narrow view that somehow gets imparted on students about what it is to to do your own thing and be an entrepreneur, um, which has a problem. But again, I think that's changing now, and, and they're going, "Oh, well, how do you apply and do innovative things across all these industries?" and what does that look like? Yeah, it's interesting. I think you're kind of, yeah, should rewind and come back to UNSW 20 years later. <laughs> so um, about, about 15 years ago, the business school and the um, uh, computer science, so the engineering school, uh, smashed a degree together, very much like the one that Robert actually did, um, to, to test it out. And that's where the Atlassian <laughs> guys, Tim that did Airtasker, the VCs out of Blackbird um, and others uh, have come from that dual degree. Um, and we're actually seeing it now. The biomedical division is pushing that together with a business degree as well. But the other interesting thing, and I think the other um, universities are like this as well, the other thing that UNSW is doing is we're doing a thing called Entrepreneurial Endeavours where we are actually going into the classroom. So we're going into the built environment and talking to the architects 
about the future of cities, you know, and, um, and we have a very big um, sort of entrepreneurship uh, open funnel where you can come and participate. We've just had a health hackathon and just get a taster. And we had about 10,000 people through those programs last year getting a little taste of entrepreneurship <laughs> so that they can dip their toe in and then they can come back and look at the journey and see, and they can actually put pressure on their lecturers to say, can we have somebody, like the public health um, team, ask for a, a presentation from the entrepreneurship team. And so we have a suite of, like, here's a 45-minute lecture or whatever that we can do. So we're, we're, it, we're late, everybody's late to the game, but I think we're sort of, you know, getting there finally. But the, I think it's also how education is structured and rewarded, right? It's still structured around students into degrees, payments and um, papers written. I don't know, Eva, would you like to shed some light on that? Yeah, I think it's time for change and people are ready for change now. Yeah. I think that's why it's important to have the in-university incubator and accelerator programs because that is open to everybody and you do have the opportunity to not only do uh, elective units which count for credit but a lot of other entrepreneurial experiences to get you started. So it can be in-curriculum, extracurricular or co-curricular. Hackathons are a great way to get started, boot camps, um, startup weekends, like I do these on the side as well because I think it's a great way for us to learn as educators to bring back to the classroom. So definitely cross-disciplinary because innovation entrepreneurship is not just tech. Uh, it, it really doesn't work well when it's just us. Yeah. Robert, how, what skills do you need to create a disruptive company? Like if somebody came to you and said, I want to get an education in, in entrepreneurship and startups, like what... what what range of skills or degrees or courses would you think that they need to take? Um, I think the most... Um, so I have two parts to that, two parts to the answer. Um, the first, I think, important hard skill that I think everyone needs to have is the understanding of data, right? Um, so understanding of how to collect data, how to analyze data, how to figure out what you are doing is working, right? Uh, and I think that's the most important. Right. Um, um, and regardless of what industry you're in, you could be in health tech, you could be in fintech, you could be in, um, in, in AI or whatever it is, you need to have the ability to collect the data that is telling you that what the product that you're working on is working um, in, in, in various different ways. Right? Um, and being able to analyze data is a, is a critical, critical skill that everyone needs to have to be a successful entrepreneur. Um, the second thing that we touched on a little bit earlier is, I think, is more of a sort of attitude or a cultural shift, right? So um, you need to really be able to embrace failure, right? Um, and so on my team, um, we actually, when uh, someone launches a project, project that fails, um, we actually have an all-hands meeting. We bring that person to the front of the room, and we gift him a bottle of wine in front of the entire staff, right? And this has created a culture in my team such that, you know, people are not afraid to, like, really swing big and, um, and try new things. Um, one of our most spectacular failures was we had um, one of our head of student operations decide to launch an offline course. So we typically we teach classes offline. Um, and he decided to launch an offline, you know, intense seven-day boot camp uh, to learn data analysis. And... Uh, by the third day, all the students walked out, <laughs> and they asked for a refund. And the team that was behind this, I mean, they were in tears. I mean, they were just, like, crushed because they had spent, you know, three months preparing for this, preparing the curriculum, preparing all the lecture materials and everything, and they were just crushed. And they went home the next Wednesday. We brought them all off the stage. We handed them a bottle of wine, and they said, okay, we're going to sit back down and go back to the drawing board. And since then, they've innovated sort of a completely new way of serving our students online, um, which has just recently sort of been launched to all of our students at Udacity globally, right? um, and with, which has been a huge, huge accomplishment. But that accomplishment was not possible if they had not first failed. Right? Um, and, uh, and come to that realization that, yes, they can swing big and, you know, um, and but so long as they learn from their failures, they can just keep moving forward. Well, that's, I think that's a really interesting topic because we hear this so often. I don't know. Oh, we've got questions. Look at you people. You're, it's going mad out there. It's crazy. 
Yeah. Hi, Robert. I'm Lucas, also from Incubate, actually. Um, so you spoke about kind of landing in Beijing with, you know, not much Chinese language experience, no network, um, and founding your first startup and selling it three years later. Do you think you could talk a little bit, a little bit about that and kind of how you approached, uh, you know, moving to a different culture, different country, um, how, how you then, what, what were kind of the steps you took to then build something successful with, with those kind of limitations you had? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was tough. Um, I remember um, looking through resumes as we were recruiting to fill our team, and I had one screen open with Google Translate and the other screen open with the resumes, and I was, like, copying and pasting and copying and pasting. It's like, oh, that's what that means, right? It took me, like, several days to go through a few hundred resumes. Um, and it, was, it was a painful experience. But I think the most important thing is to, to leverage sort of the networks that you may already have. Um, so a lot of us have built up networks, whether it be through schools that we've been through or through social networks. And when you get on the ground in a new city or a new country, the first thing to do is, is look through that Rolodex, right? Reach out to alumni of your school, um, which is a particularly powerful network, and connect with those people first. Um, and get them to sort of connect with people with, um, that are, are doing similar things and so on and so forth. And that's really the first step, right? Um, the second thing I did was um, attend a lot of events like this, um, where you get to meet a lot of other like-minded people and sort of trade ideas, swap ideas, and start to build relationships where you start to understand, you know, the nuances of uh, starting a company locally, right? Um, and from there, I mean, everything is, is about network. You know, the team you recruit, the funding that you raise, um, the information that you gain in the market that gives you insight into what you need to succeed in that market, um, you need to really, really heavily rely on a very local network to get you there. Um, it's incredibly difficult for you just to land somewhere and without any knowledge of the local market, any knowledge of the local ecosystem to try to succeed. And that's been sort of the source of failure of, of most Silicon Valley startups that have landed in the US, um, as most of them have continued to be run by headquarters, um, which have no sense of what's going on what's going on on the ground. And so, I mean, I would say, I mean, getting to know the local landscape through a local network, I think that's the, the, the number one key. Right. I, I think it's, I, I just wanted to add to that, I think it's kind of the, the, funny, the funny joke is, you know, um, um, join this um, hot global startup, um, must move to Silicon Valley to work there. Um, um, and and uh, I think that's I always think that's a funny uh, way to look at it because in some sense there is a really uh, there is something there is something about local network effects that have a big difference in building a business. Um, um, although although recently we you know we have seen also a big rise in remote teams too, but even so with remote teams there's still like an anchor point or an office somewhere where, where there's like the the head office or something like that. Um, but yeah. Eva, do you have anything to add to the setting up in a new country or a culture? I think it's firstly a really bold move um, to get yourself out of the comfort zone, but I think don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, mm -hmm. There's always going to be a community out there, and it's just there's going to be people like you who are going to be, oh, look, I don't want to be the only one, but you're never the only one. Yeah, cool. I, I do have a quick tip, though, if you are looking overseas and you're Aussie, the alumni networks of the Australian universities are really, really <laughs> deep in China because there's so many Chinese students that come here and they absolutely, a lot of them absolutely love their time at the university. So by all means, go to them. Like, you know, for example, with Sydney Uni, when we go there, we host these huge, like 500 people plus alumni events in Shanghai and Beijing. And it is crazy, the talent there. They are like leaders in private equity, venture capital, all the industries because they're so well educated and they come back to China with all this international experience. So... But do leverage that. Okay. So blue here, and then we've got a couple over here. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my question is to the panel. So, um, Robert, you were saying, you know, just leveraging those networks just when you're starting off. Um, so we're a couple of months into our venture. Um, so my question was, what platforms are available to raise capitals in Australasia currently, uh, if any? So uh, if you guys can let us know. I mean, so similar to, uh, similar to Incubate, I mean, there's a large number of accelerated programs um, and also, you know, sort of incubators out there. Um, spe spe specifically in Shanghai, I know of there's um, 
China Accelerator, uh, which is also associated with, with SOS Ventures, um, which is uh, one of the largest sort of accelerators or uh, early stage investors sort of in, in, in Asia Pacific. Um, and so they're, they're extremely active. Uh, they have a large number of actually uh, foreign entrepreneurs um, in their sort of portfolio um, and a large number of successes um, that have come out of that business. And so, I mean, those are um, great first starts. But you now, as an entrepreneur that with just an idea, sometimes uh, it's difficult to get, you know, interest from a venture fund as well. Um, so typically, I mean, again, it's important to go to that alumni network. Um, typically, you know, for my first startup, um, my angel investor was a Stanford alum um, and who just said, okay, I mean, we went to the same school, like, you seem nice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> million dollars, you know, like, um, and so I think that's, I mean, that's how you just have to find money where you can get it. I think when you're very first starting, you, your first 10000 20000 $100,000, um, and you just have to, 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 to really, really look hard for, for any, any sort of leads that you can get. What, what country are you thinking of? Uh, where you want to kind of land and expand, you know? Okay. And do you have aspirations to any particular region? Okay. Cool. Cool. So we have some oh, questions up the back here. Just, just to add to that question about your paths of funding, um, you can look into um, um, non-invest, non-dilutive funding as well. So um, crowdfunding pre-sales, things like that, um, work really, really well. Um, uh, and uh, it can be a good way to get your first bit of money cash in to show that there's some interest in what you're doing. That's a really good way to start. Yeah. Uh, Robert, what you said before about um, being okay to fail, uh, I think we have a risk-averse culture, especially uh -huh. in corporate businesses. I've uh, worked in businesses where it's not okay to make a mistake, even at home. Um, like my son, who's in year six, doing his maths homework, he doesn't like getting things wrong. We, we really need to change that culture in society to, you know, try to get it right. So, and that's a big part of, you know, being a successful startup. Uh, however, the question I had for you was more along the lines of, you said data is really important. However, there's a million and one things you could actually uh, measure. So would you say what are some of the key measures, uh, for especially for a startup, you know, what, what are the main things that you're looking to actually measure initially that you must absolutely get right? Customers. <laughs> Number of customers. Yeah, but it could be retention. It could be you know, just acquisition. There's a whole bunch of things in that number of customers. Does that make sense? Like you could be getting them, but they could be going out the back door just as quickly. Then I'll add number of paid customers. But you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, though... So, so obviously you have to have profitable business. I think that's number one. Um, the, 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 really, the, the key metric that we look at, which is a popular metric that's used by a lot of companies uh, today, is, is called uh, net promoter score. Right? Uh, so net promoter score, if you're familiar with it, is basically you ask all of your customers on a scale of 1 to 10, of 0 to 10, how, how likely are you to recommend the service to your friends? Right? And you take the percentage who score 9 to 10 and you subtract the percentage who score zero to seven, and that's your net promoter score, right? And so if you, if you have a net promoter score of like 30 or 40 or 50 or above, um, that's an amazing score. And that's basically for companies like Uber or like Airbnb, um, they have really focused on creating this culture where, I mean, where consumers are like, oh my God, they just rave yeah. about Uber yeah. and Airbnb to their friends, right? Um, and an interesting story about, I mean, Airbnb and the competitor Window in Europe, Window um, approached the whole Airbnb business very much like a, a business, right? Whereas Airbnb very focused on was very focused on creating a culture of sort of um, building friendships and networks between like the hosts and the and the people who would stay in your home, right? And that created this um, amazing word of mouth for Airbnb, uh, which allowed Airbnb to eventually crush Window um, and and grow to how it's grown today, right? So MPS is really, I think, in my mind, the most important metric because, yes, the number of in customers, as you said, number of customers coming in is, is important, but if every one of those customers can recommend two customers more, 
yeah. then your cost of acquisition becomes goes down to zero, right? And then your, your business explodes. Um, and so that is literally the most important metric to look at, and that will tell you how to adjust your product, how to adjust your service, and whether or not you have a business that can go grow to like a billion dollars. That's the best answer I've heard. I've heard so many people talking about lean canvases and business canvases and you know what metrics you need to measure, but I reckon that is absolutely the key to actually get that exponential growth. Cool. Satisfied customer, NPS <laughs> score of... I highly recommend it. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Gentleman down the back. Hi. Um, just give me a bit of my background. I went to the University of New South Wales. It was Yay. a good start and did um, a business degree there. Um, over the years, I worked with some large corporations, some small businesses, and I've had a number of businesses myself. Um, in the section that I teach in TAFE at the moment, in business and small business, particularly in the small business, we've helped hundreds of people to start businesses. Um, when I did my university course, it wasn't really too practical. At TAFE here, we're extremely practical. We can teach people, and we've got some of our students here now, uh, what to do. I teach a number of different units, finance and law. And from that, it's very practical. They can go out and they can apply what they've learned. Mm. Um, is your program that practical um, for all the education here and the entrepreneur program? How practical is it? Okay, that's a great question. So let's uh, take it from the top. Eva, how practical is what you're actually teaching for people to get out of the gate, become an entrepreneur and start a company? Yeah, I think tertiary education and online courses, it's complementary, right? It's whatever works for you. So we have students who are highly practical who are actually better suited to the TAFE system and vocational, and that's a great way to be. Universities can be kind of the middle ground of that, where if students who are really interested in the theory part of it can go to university, they can combine it with practical, or they could also do a practical-based learning. It's just that they have to have the conversation with us early so we can prepare them for that. So, yeah, definitely it's changing, um, but I think it's the awareness that it's not a replacement, it's complementary, and also students can start at TAFE and also transition and move into the university sector as well. Especially in engineering, which is where I come from, um, I have to say the whole degree is practical because you don't want to be graduating uh, impractical engineers because that has a large consequence. But I can't speak for the other faculties, but it is shifting. James, do you want to... Uh, so for Incubate's program, so um, uh, one of our flagship programs is a 14-week accelerator. Um, uh, you know, we don't, you don't get credit points for doing that. Um, 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 you, you, get a, you get a real business if you go through that and actually... Um, um, do the process and talk to customers and things like that. The way we help them, and so there's no actual formal lectures or formal courses. Um, um, the probably the most formal thing we have is, is workshops, which are extremely practical, which is around the business topics. But but that works because we're we've got a group of people, generally pretty young, who are trying to build and launch a startup, and so we're actually going week on week with that process with them. And so in that regard. The, the, the way it works for us is, is purely mentoring. So then that, that changes from like one-on-one -on -one mentoring with the founders to um, group mentoring to um, um, uh, sort of advisory, like broader advisory networks as well. Um, so yeah, it's extremely practical. But that's, that's us and that's an accelerator. Um, the other interesting thing about that is, is a lot of the time we run into problems where it's like no one knows the solution. Like I don't know the solution. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I haven't started all businesses. I, I don't have the experience that other entrepreneurs do. And then even our mentors, who are like super experienced, they go, I don't know, you know. And so one of the most interesting things I think about entrepreneurship is just being comfortable with this idea of like, well, no one. There's no good solution out there, so we better just go like work something out. And I think a lot of what we do is help people through that process. And. Um, um, but I, I would say that a lot of courses are just not at all practical. Um, they're set up to be highly theoretical and teaching people about theory. Um, and I think that's that's going to be, uh, yeah, that can be problematic. Yeah. Um, well, sorry. Just, oh, sorry. Keep, sorry. Go, go. Yeah. Um, teaching in the small business area, we, um, I teach finance, and it's extremely practical. I find that's... Uh, probably the most difficult thing for people to get their head around, um, unless they've done an accounting um, studies. Um, do, do you teach this sort of thing, how to, to plan with their finances? Uh, I run them through the financial statements. They make up a financial plan, which is extremely practical. 
and obviously that dovetails with other units that they, they, uh, they learn. And it tends to be the most prominent cause of businesses failing, lack of understanding of the financial side of it. Obviously, there's other things out which are vital as well, but whatever they do, like, virtually translates back to the financial side of it as well, whether it's in marketing, it's in HR, etc. And the financial side, I see my own view, is extremely important. Yeah, thanks for that. I think, um, and I'll, I'll just jump in from the uh, UNSW point of view. So um, all of our <laughs> universities, I'm just going to talk the collective we, you know, where we have a series of engagement strategies around different stages, and they can be, you know, um, practical or theoretical. And so we have these, like the hackathons, where you, it's, you, you get to learn about an area and come up with a real solution. Um, to pre-accelerators where we take people in and we, uh, at UNSW we have ones called Start, Launch, Grow and Start is literally that how do I start a business, get it registered, find co-founders and then launch, we take you through the finance of launching and your cap table and Grow is financing and getting real customers and then we go on to same as Incubate, we have one called 10X which is our flagship accelerator where they dive deep into their business for, for 10 weeks and we you know, pull them apart. It's a very hands-on. But we also try to give them practical learning experiences by, with our health accelerator people, we take them to India so that they can see what working in an underserved market really looks like. Or we take them to San Francisco so that they can see what an innovation economy feels like. And sometimes those experiential things um, you know, a very, very, uh, it creates the mind shift that we need to kind of get the companies to go where they want to go. But we do teach them, we don't, in the incubators and accelerators, we don't dive into a finance course, but we do teach them the basics about their cap table, how to raise money, how to manage their finances, and um, get them going on other products like Zero. I imagine you teach them all how to use zero, etc. So I don't know if the others want to jump in, or Robert, if you've got a different perspective about what Udacity does in teaching people these um, core skills. Um, I mean, specifically in teaching the skills, I don't have a strong perspective. But I think that, I mean, for, for entrepreneurs, the most important thing is to understand your, what they call unit economics, to make sure that for every unit that you sell, you're not losing money, right? I mean, and, and so long as that your unit economics are strong, um, you have a strong gross margin for, for, for what you're selling, um, then, then you have a potential to build a strong business. And I think if you dumb it down, the finance down, down to just that, um, if, if as you're building your businesses, if you can just remember that, I think that's the most important thing to, to keep in mind. I, I would say I don't think teaching them to manage their finances is the most important thing, uh, at least not, not in our course. I just don't think it's super high value until you know until you've a better understanding of what exactly the business is you're trying to build. Mm. And so teaching people, this is a, the problem with theory is like, if you, people aren't going to use it, they forget it. Um, and there's a lot to be said about theory that you learn in university courses that you will never use, right? And so the question is like, is that a waste of time? And so like teaching um, students about finance when they're never going to be an accountant or never going to have to run a business, it's like, oh, well, I don't care, like, why bother? And it's the same with our startups. It's like, there's so much stuff for them to do. I don't care if you don't know how to run the books. Do you even know if there's anyone that wants to buy what you want to buy? Mm -hmm. Before you even, there are no books to run. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like to the other the other way to say it is all startups are non-profit. Uh, <laughs> um, um, that's true. It's, <laughs> they don't make money. Um, so you know, once you start making money, okay, then you got to start understanding the fundamentals. But like the most basic thing is yeah, human economics and the business model. Like what is it? How much are you going to charge? Who's going to who's going to pay you money? So I think there's a unique value proposition where you're, you're sitting out to teach people those skills. Because I think the other thing too is, um, you know, we're also, also doing entrepreneurship at scale. Like we have like 55,000 people at UNSW. So, you know, to affect 10 or 20 people is not going to move the needle on mindset or thinking. And so we actually have to do probably broader programs to affect many more. I think this is where the position of the in-house incubators is really important because mm -hmm. changing curriculum uh, is a very slow-moving beast, but the entrepreneurship ecosystem changes much faster than that. So it's taking what your university is giving you because uh, the education model at the moment, it's just 
in case learning. It is not just in time learning, which is kind of where things need to be. So it's going to take a little while to shift. But the only thing I'd say is if you've got something you want to do, you want to put it into practice, that's when you link in to the incubators to make it happen with your course. I have a question for Robin. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, are you, are you asking Robin yeah, a question? Yeah, no, I have a question for Robin on, on the skills, which is uh, where has Udacity seen the most success in online courses in terms of the outcomes of the students? Um, I would say uh, there's, I mean, there's, there's three major areas that we're particularly strong in. One is in data science, uh, two is in AI, and three is in self-driving car. Um, and the reason is that you know, these three areas are incredibly hot areas today. Um, every industry, uh, whether it be biotech or fintech or, 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 or um, um, uh, uh, you know, I can't think of the English word right now, but like taking like tags and, and Ubers and stuff like that. Like they all use this, the, these types of technologies, um, and so and there's a huge shortage of this talent today, um, and that's why sort of we're playing in that space. Yeah. That was an unauthorized question, by the way. Just saying. <laughs> Breaking the rules. Okay. <laughs> Cross panel questions. <laughs> there's a question there. Yeah. Um, sorry to kind of go. I just want to backtrack for a second. I'm a student of communications law at UTS, and. Um, it wasn't really until I started working in communications in entrepreneurship that I really even touched this whole sphere um, because it's never been part of my degree. And I think that as, commu as communications and law students in particular, actually, we get funneled into very kind of rigid career paths. And it's really hard to break out of those things when you're not taught from the beginning that you have opportunities to break out of those. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering what do you think that universities can be doing more of, or what can we as students be encouraging within our degrees to kind of break out of those really rigid career paths and try to kind of um, maybe cross-collaborate between faculties or, um, yeah, break into this sphere because I think it's so interesting and it's really exciting for me, but I'm almost, I'm like three-quarters of the way through my degree and I've never, ever been given opportunities like this. So, yeah. Great question. Eva, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is where collaboration is absolutely key. So collaboration between students. So if you're interested in doing something, tell somebody about it, talk to your lecturers and ask them, what can I do with where I want to go? How do I make this part of my degree? You shouldn't have to do everything on the side. So this is why I love teaching first year. It has its challenges, but it's where we can start to identify where do students want to go and how do we get you there. And I introduce the concept of startups, entrepreneurship, UTS styles, what's available from day one. Um, it is unfortunate that sometimes you find out about things a little bit too late, but it's never too late. So whatever you find that's interesting to you, dive in. It can be as small as a weekend startup boot camp. Just get going. And now that you know this, share it back. Reach out to the business societies, jump into lectures and tell the students, look, this is what I'm interested in, this is how I got involved, and this is what could be your pathway as well. So. What about like work integrated learning or internships? I mean, what we're trying to do is place... We, we're going into the faculties and saying, give us your students and we'll put them into startups instead of sending them off to the big banks or whatever. So, you know, obviously you've got to comply with that. So what, what's happening at um, Sydney? Are you guys looking at working integrated learning into startups or something as well? Uh, in, 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 yes, sort of. <laughs> uh, Sydney's slow when it comes to these things. Um, um, I... I would say your. Um, I would say there's there's I think there's a couple of I think there's a few different problems um, you've identified in that in kind of this idea of like why why can't I be exposed to startups or why why is it so many students will leave university and not know um, there's multiple options for them um, and I think um, it comes down a lot to the way we um, incentivize students right now. Which is to essentially uh, get a, you know, these, these credentials that you need to get um, to say to somehow validate that you're moving forward. And like one of those is like get a degree. The second one is like get your first job. The second one is like get a pay rise. And it's like these are the things that everyone unanimously goes, oh, these are good things, and you should all go for those things. But unfortunately, that doesn't really help in terms of you understanding the opportunities around you, especially when the opportunities don't mean you get any of those credentials. And so I think, I think and one of those, one of, one of the classic examples of failed business, 
Like, what credential is that? I mean, that's, that's like the worst credential, right? That's like terrible. But from an entrepreneur perspective, that's a fantastic credential. You're like, why did it fail? What happened? Yeah. You blew through a million bucks and it failed, or 1.5 for our latest failure. I was like, well, actually, this is why, blah, 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 blah. And this is all the reasons why you not you have to do it differently. And, and the, so, so I think part of this is that credentials don't, um, aren't very valuable things to aim for. Um, in and of itself, unless you understand what the opportunities are around them. Um, and I think, I think that, that, that's a systemic problem. So I don't think you're going to solve that necessarily. But having entrepreneur incubators and stuff on campus is the first step in that. And I think that's really, really important. And interdisciplinary stuff, so getting exposed to lots of things is really important. Um, one of the best, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm rambling here, but one of the best um, um, uh, analogies I've come across is actually from computer science which is um, if you have a goal um, and you know where you want to hit, then that's fantastic, right? So if you start university and you want to get into finance and you want to be a banker, <laughs> amazing. Go do finance, blah, 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 get, climb those ranks, do what you want to do. Um, for most people, they don't know what they want to do. Um, and so in computer science, there's something called the um, hill finding algorithm, which is like what's the best way to get to the top of the hill if you don't know where the hill is? If you can't see the top of the hill, and the top of the hill is an analogy for what your goal is. And it turns out the best thing you can do is just to drop yourself in random parts and start climbing. And I, I really like that analogy because it's all about go and explore, go try lots of different things. If you have no idea what you want to do, then get exposed to lots of things. And so I think one of the worst things about degrees right now is they, they, they start to funnel you into one thing and tell you about nothing else. And so, so some of the work with some of the more progressive work is like, no, actually, first you should get exposed to lots of stuff, right? Mm. And that's really, really good. Um, so, so as a student, I think just like if you don't know what you want to do, try lots of things and get exposed to lots of things um, is, is one of the best things, uh, one of the best strategies. Cool. Question just here. Hi. Yeah, my name is Josh Cronin. Uh, I'm the founder of a new product that I'm trying to bring to market at the moment, but uh, it's it's I think it's world changing. It's something that is definitely needed in the world today. But uh, I, while I have the product, I have samples. I haven't even have even have an army. Like I'm not sure how to bring it to market. How to get my first customer? Like I'm already in contact with a few people who've shown interest, but I don't know where to go. I don't know. Whether I should keep pestering them, I think that's gonna that's just gonna piss them off, and they're gonna be like, "All right, I'm gonna piss this with this guy." It's just annoying. So I don't know what to do, and I think is it do I just expand my network, talk to as many people as I can, or what do I do? That's a, a very big question. <laughs> who's, who's got a couple of quick yeah, uh, solutions uh, uh, for the uh, brain here? I, I, so I don't know your situation specifically, so I'm just going to sort of more, uh, speak more broadly about that stage you're in, which is like, I don't know who my customers are. Um, the best thing you can do is expand your network and speak to more customers and understand their mindset. Um, and um, so, so like, that's like the brute force thing. It's just like... Beyond everything else, try and do that because you got to understand. You got to understand why they want to buy or solve. I start my product's all about sustainability, and it's if it gets adopted all over the world, it's going to stop over two million trees from getting cut down every yeah. year, which is massively needed. It's sure. one of the reasons I started this two years ago. Sure. I, I think I don't think we're going to solve the problem right now on stage, but all I'd say is, um, <laughs> um, um, yeah, speak to customers would be my like. You know, default yeah. generic answer. Customer validation yeah. is yes. the key well, thing. I would add. I would add to that. So, so sometimes um, there are some markets in which the, the end users are actually not the people who pay or make the decision to pay. Right. So yeah, let's take um, uh, like uh, K twelve education or, or online education for kids like the same age as my daughter, like three to four. Right. She's not gonna make pull out a credit card, <laughs> like log in online and like buy this game or, or this app or whatever it is. I am right, um, and so for you, it's it's really important to understand, you know, who's the decision maker that is going to actually pay for your product and who is the end user. Uh, if they happen to be the same person, that's great. Um, if they're different, it's important to know. Yeah, or if it's business to business, right? Um, and then first of all, I mean, doing whatever you can to like build that network and get your first hundred customers. Um, 
whether it be, I mean, giving it to them for free or selling it for, for a cheaper price so you can get feedback. And that's how you get started. And then once you get some feedback, then you can start rolling. I can sell my product. I need a significant amount of capital to keep the product. While I have samples, that's as much as the machine manufacturer in China is going to give me in terms of supply and make a purchase system over it's not easy. It's okay. Hard. Well, th yeah. thanks for sharing, and that potentially, as we go some networking, there will be some people in the audience that might also have some uh, interesting ideas that you um, can talk to them about. So, um, we're actually getting to the end of this panel right now. So, if there's any questions, we can take them offline into the networking a little bit later on. Um, so, we started out here talking about equipping you and your startups to succeed in Australasia. We kind of didn't. We did a little bit about getting outside of Australia, but I think there's a bigger opportunity there about how do we we get into the international markets. But in closing, I'd just like to sort of go around to each of our panelists and say one message to give to the audience. What do you think is the key message that you would like them to take with them today? Um, I'd love everybody to walk out with an action that they're going to do today. You've walked in here for a reason, you're interested in startups and entrepreneurship and you've got somewhere that you want to go, what's the one thing you're going to do today? Nice one. Um, I think my key message would be to be fearless, right? And put yourself in uncomfortable positions, right? Um, whether it be sort of leaving that path of getting the degree and getting the first job and getting the pay raise or, you know, getting out there and talking to customers or, um, you know, going, in, going on the subway and talking to people, random people, and getting them to give you feedback on your product, you have to be used to being extremely uncomfortable if you want to succeed as an entrepreneur. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I think, uh, think uh, I'd always encourage people to think big. So if, if, if Asia is what you're interested in, absolutely go for it. It's, uh, we have no rule books on this yet in terms of Asian businesses that are across Asian countries. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting because people will write their books on this in the next 10 to 20 years, and it'll be very interesting to see those people who do. Um, but right now, we don't, and so I think we're going to have to make it. And definitely, I would not um, rely on you know European or American models in that regard. I think it's going to be something that's unique to Asia in terms of how you build and expand in Asia. Um, so I think that's really interesting. So I'd say um, um, that would be my leaving point on this thing. And then the other thing I'd say was... is. Is it, is it um, one day or is it day one? So. Very profound. Thank you for being such an awesome audience. So give yourself a round of applause. Um, and, uh, I'd like to also thank our esteemed panel. So Eva, Robert and James, thank you so much for giving up your time this afternoon. We appreciate that. And um, we'll be, uh, there's some networking and going on now. So we'll talk to you out the back there. Thank you, everybody. It's been great. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> 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 <laughs>